notice here a little lady say recording in progress as well um so just in case you do not want to be recorded or your image used in any of this feel free to turn off your camera again um and we encourage you to use the chat um so this is a meeting style we decided to go with a meeting style platform so that there is some engagement um and you can see the faces of speakers and other folks like you are joining us this evening and so we encourage you to use the chat and to just do a quick practice we invite you to let us know where you're joining us from um, and as we're approaching spring, um, I invite you to share what your favorite thing about spring is. Um, if you say allergies, we might have to talk about this in the corner. But um, other than that, I invite you to just let us know where in the world you're joining us from today and one thing you like about spring, um, just to make sure your chat is working and you have a drop down op option. Remember to use everyone in meeting so that you communicate with the hosts, the panelists, as well as other participants. Um, as we go through the program, as you hear folks speak, we invite you to use the chat to ask questions um, do, while the speaker is, um, is presenting so that once the speaker is done, they have your questions teed up and can answer them in a quick manner. We also just ask that you keep conversations in the chat to the to what we're talking about in this meeting today, so as to not distract both the panelists and other participants from from what they you know showed up here to listen to today. So um, there is a function where you can directly chat at someone if you have a specific question, like "Oh, Ellen, I really like your sweater. What a beautiful orange color." I'll just chat that to Ellen in the chat box and not put it everywhere else so that everyone else can concentrate. Um, and so, if you have any tech questions, um, you can just reach out to Penel, me, Larissa, Rosalie, and you'll see the little co-host bracket by our names on the drop down, so you know who you're speaking with directly. And we will try our possible best to put on our tech hat and support you um, to make sure that you have the best of this experience. Um, and so I will go ahead and just call us for a quick moment of silence to center us, um, bring us into the space. Thank you all. so much for taking the moment to be centered here. Um, once again, for folks who are just joining, my name is Penel Ibe, and I am the Just Economies Policy Engagement Coordinator with the American Friends Service Committee. Um, for many of you, I'm sure you're familiar with AFSC, but for folks who are not familiar with AFSC, AFSC has presence AFSC has presence in over 16, in about 16 countries um, across the world, including 24 programs in 19 states in the United States. AFSC is guided by the Quaker belief in the divine light of each person, and we work closely with communities and partners worldwide to challenge unjust systems and promote lasting, sustainable peace. Um, we are hosting this, um, this webinar teach-in conversation with our trusted partners and sister organization, the Friends Committee on National Legislation, and we'll be hearing from many colleagues from the Friends Committee on National Legislation as well um, as we go through the program. Um, as our title and this beautiful graphic you see on your screen says, this is a Quaker call to environmental justice for all. We like rhymes here, um, so bear with us. You have to have some fun with this. Um, and um, as we all know, in our world today, so much is going on. Um, there's so many things that you could be involved in at this hour. Um, you could also be watching Netflix. So we're super grateful um, that you responded to this call today and to hear how 
um, we in AFSC and FCNL um, are working to, to ensure environmental justice for all communities, for everyone. What is currently going on in the world today? What kind of efforts are ongoing? And also responding to this call to see how you can plug in, how you can be involved, and how you can take what you're learning from this space back to your communities. We know that um, all people have a right to pure air, clean water, um, an environment that enriches life, but we also know that many are not afforded this right. For many, these rights are still unrealized. And that injustice creates a pattern of continuous suffering across our communities. Across the nation, our, life, uh, our source of livelihood, water and air, the core of it is being polluted with impunity at a great consequence to our health and environment. We also know that this pollution and the systems that cause this pollution have also led to the ongoing climate crisis that we are, that we are currently um, concerned with as, as a society, as the human race in general. Um, in our work, we see that many communities have borne the brunt of this pollution and those communities are now on the front lines of climate change as well. We know that they are often hit first and hit the worst. And we also know that our government tends to turn a blind eye um, to this community's plight, more so in communities of color, in marginalized communities, lower income communities, um, regardless of race than others. And so in this work, to, in this call today, we want to look at how we can challenge that injustice with the call to environmental justice. And so briefly, just for an order of events, you will hear from me briefly about principles that ground us in environmental justice, the principles we look to every time to make sure that we are walking the right path of those who came before us, of the communities who have worked tirelessly to ensure that, um, that we do not lose sight of our goals for environmental justice. Then you hear from my colleague Rosalie, who will talk about the current state of play in Congress. What are elected officials doing about this? How are they putting their money where their mouth is on the issue? And then we'll hear from my colleague Saira, um, representing the AFSC New Mexico program, about how communities are taking matters into their own hands, while also ensuring that elected officials are held accountable to promises made. Then we'll hear from three great advocacy core members with FCNL as well, who are doing active lobbying on environmental justice-like legislation, who are meeting with um, elected officials to hear about their experience. Lobbying is also is very fancy a term, and it's actually very approachable and very accessible for many. So excited to hear from them how they've been exploring this in the past year. And we'll close out with a call to action. Like we said, this is a Quaker call. We're not going to leave you without things to do, places to be, and things to learn. And so we'll wrap up in that way. We'll have moments for Q and A um, after certain speakers, so that um, folks are being um, folks are clear where we're going, and we're going along this journey together. Um, so I will just ask Rosalie for the next slide, please. So in, in this movement, in this work, when you hear environmental justice, there are a bunch of principles that guide us. And in, in true fashion, we, um, we look at these principles and these principles are put forward by communities who have experienced the injustice, who have experienced environmental racism. That is communities that are heavily targeted for hazardous industries and hazardous practices more than other communities. These are communities who understand that you do not intentionally have to have a discriminatory effect, but that does not negate the impact that it has had on their communities. Um, these are communities who are still recovering from centuries um, long um, eras of colonial rule, colonial, um, colonial practices, and the aftermath of that. These are communities whose, um, whose resources, both human and natural and land, have been exploited multiple times. And these are communities that came together in 1991 as um, part of the first national people of color um, environmental leadership summit to draft certain principles to say we want to dictate the terms to which we will be restored we want to dictate the terms to which um, we will our injustices will be acknowledged and will be atoned for and so they put forward these 17 principles of environmental justice i won't go through all 17 of them and these principles have served as a defining document for the growing movement for environmental justice from the grassroots to um, halls of power, to international bodies. These are strong principles that were grounded in the experience of communities of color. Um, you can see the website there. We'll follow up with that link as well if you want to review that and learn more about what really influenced this space. Next slide, please, Rosalie. 
Um, I'm just going to take a moment here to pick up on 10 of the principles. So I said there were 17, but I looked at these 10 and there was a theme that came across them. Um, you might've heard the same, nothing um, about us without us. That is self-autonomy, self-determination. Um, that is something that is very central to environmental justice. These principles that I highlighted are very important when it comes to decision-making. Today, we'll be talking a lot about policy and how policy is made. Um, how policies are decided on, how they are put into place. And so policies are decisions. Um, policies also require accountability. Policies also um, co cover multiple aspects of life, the political, the economic, the cultural. Um, and policies is what brought us to where we are today. Policies is what caused the problems that we have today. And so when we think about them, these principles are what pull us um, to order, so to speak. These principles guide our path and tell us to stay on the straight and the narrow, make sure that whatever it is we're putting forward, however we're getting to them, we need to make sure that um, we are protecting the rights of individuals, that we are affirming the needs of individuals, that we are um, consent that there's consent, that individuals are being brought into this process, right? Like we're letting people know what decisions we're making, both the present and the future generation, um, that we're making sure that there's equ equitable access to these spaces, that the tables have everyone on them, not many being discussed without their presence there. So I'll just give about a minute or two for folks to just, um, I just say take one principle, no need to read all 10 at the moment, just take one principle that really resonates with you and read it out loud to yourself um, and just internalize what this means. Because whether you identify as someone who's a com from a community of color or not, environmental justice affects you. There's a big difference here between environmental equity and justice. And we say justice because it is not about making sure everybody is equitably discriminated against, but that no Nobody is discriminated against. And so this matters to, um, to us, it matters to your community, regardless of how you identify. So just a minute there, I just recommend you pick one principle, read it to yourself, and then we'll, we'll get going. Thank you all so much for taking that moment um, to, to just review this. Um, once again, I invite you to take some time to revisit the 1991 draft, where all of these came from, what led to that moment, and really what has happened post that. What other principles have been developed from this? And many other principles that we are using in this movement, um, GEMS principles of organizing, so many spaces where communities of, colors have, communities of color have actually articulated how we can do this work with true justice at the core of it. So now I'm going to pass on to, um, to Rosalie. Um, Rosalie is going to talk to us about um, legislation. Um, sounds boring, I know, but this is a really, well, it's very rare that we have legislation in our Congress, so the US Congress, um, that really has the voice of communities there in a way that feels consultative, in a way that feels like at every stage and every iteration of the legislation, communities are asked for their opinion, for their thoughts, for their experience to inform that. And so Rosalie is going to talk about the Environmental Justice for All Act, very simple to remember, um, and, and what the bill entails, what it contains, why the bill has the, the legitimacy of being called an environmental justice bill, um, and uh, yeah, where it is in Congress today. So I'm going to share my screen so that Rosalie can present. So just bear with me as we do a little switcheroo here. Thanks so much, Penel. Yeah, it's really great to see some familiar faces here and also new faces as well. My name is Rosalie Reitz. I'm the Program Assistant for Sustainable Energy and Environment with FCNL. Um, I am feeling a little bit under the weather tonight, so if I need to take a pause, I hope you'll excuse me if I need to uh, do a little cough or sneeze in the middle of my presentation, but hopefully all will go well. Spring is the time after all for both allergies and, and colds going around, so I hope the rest of you are feeling better than I am tonight. 
Yeah, so I'll jump right into the Environmental Justice for All Act. This was originally released in 2020 by Representatives Grijalva and McEachin as part of the House Natural Resources Committee. Over the past two years, it's you know gone through a series of forums, roundtables, and hearings um, to get it to where it is today. A really core part of the Environmental Justice for All Act is that it centers the affected communities in its creation. The Environmental Justice for All Act is one of very few bills in Congress that do that, which is why we're so proud to support that. There are really three main pieces of this bill that I really want to touch on today. The first of which is amending, it has the ability to amend the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to prohibit discrimination based on disparate impact and overturn the Supreme Court decision in, in, excuse me, in Alexander v. S Sandoval to permit private citizens, residents, and organizations to seek legal remedy when faced with discrimination. In much simpler terms, this essentially means private citizens can sue for disparate impact in their environment, essentially environmental discrimination. The second really important piece is updating the Clean Water and Clean Air Acts to consider the cumulative impacts in their permitting decisions. So cumulative impacts are the combined incremental actions of human activity. This essentially means that the acts would need to sum not only the impacts of a given project over time, but also how the environmental impacts of that project would interact with others nearby or you know, at the same time. So an example to put this into perspective, if you live right in between a coal plant and a hog farm, both of those give off air pollution that you are breathing in. And the total effect of the air pollution from both of those sources is greater than each of them combined. It's greater than the sum of those, of those two pollutants. So this is really important. It's also really difficult. At this time, there's not really one model or one perfect method for identifying cumulative impacts, but this has the potential to really spur the study in that and make sure that, you know, you know, the science is out there. We want to make sure that um, this can be done. So the last one I'll touch on is the funding. Uh, this act would provide $75 million annually for grants to support projects that specifically address environmental and public health is issues. And these grants would go to environmental justice communities or those, you know, serving them. So let's talk about the life cycle of the bill. You know, how has Congress been looking at this bill? As, as I mentioned, it was created in a very um, community-centered approach, which we really appreciate. Um, and because of that has largely been, quote unquote, on tour for the majority of its lifespan. This means that listening sessions have been held in the past with various communities like Michigan, Louisiana, New Mexico, California, and others. And their listening sessions coming up this summer, again, Michigan, New Mexico, Louisiana, Illinois, California. Um, so those first round of listening sessions took place in the fall of 2020, the rest are taking place this summer. Um, this bill is still currently in the works in the House Natural Resources Committee since it was reintroduced in 117th session of Congress. And as the, as the committee continues to get feedback on the bill from communities, it has the potential to undergo changes in the form of amendments during committee markups. So going from here on, oh, I'm seeing a question. What is a listening session? Great question. Um, that essentially is um, they set up a forum or kind of a town hall um, in person uh, in these, these states, in these communities that I'm mentioning, where people can come and give feedback on the content of the bill, explain how it affects their community, you know, what, what things they think could improve this or what things they think could be potentially harmful. And all of this feedback goes, into the, goes to the committee and they consider it as they consider amendments for the bill. Thank you for that question. So what is the life of the bill gonna look like from here on out? As it goes through these listening sessions, we'll get potential um, amendments. Those would be considered during a, a committee markup and the, any proposed amendments would, be needed, would need to be voted on within the committee. Then, you know, if all goes well, you know, vote some, some amendments in, some out, you know, get, get that bill repackaged. The committee would recommend the bill to the House to be considered for a vote. 
you know, the Speaker of the House decides which bills to raise for a vote in the House. So hopefully that would, you know, get, get selected. And then um, the bill would be open for debate, amendments, and then voting within the, the greater um, House of Representatives. If the Environmental Justice for All Act is voted, you know, positively in the House, just needs a simple majority of 218 votes to pass and to get sent to the Senate, where the process would repeat in the Senate. So that's pretty much what we're looking at in Congress. This is the biggest bill for environmental justice in Congress right now. Um, and that's really where we're seeing the most movement. Um, next slide. Perfect. The next thing I wanted to touch on um, is the state of play in the executive branch, right? So what is the administration, what are federal agencies doing around environmental justice? The first thing I wanna to touch on is the Justice 40 initiative, which you've probably heard um, coming out of some correspondence from the White House. Justice 40 details that 40% of federal climate and clean energy investments will go towards disadvantaged communities. This is most clearly seen in the fiscal year 23 appropriations process. That is just the president's proposed budget for fiscal year 2023. There are four main components of, um, you know, the environment, clean energy aspects of this proposed budget that I really wanted to touch on today and explain how Justice 40 is being used or is being, you know, implemented in this proposed budget. The first one is funding of $31 million for an equitable clean energy transition initiative. This would build capacity and help provide technical assistance to help energy and environmental justice communities you know, navigate and benefit from the transition to a clean energy economy. Some environmental justice communities are ones that have been built off um, fossil fuel industries, and that's really what their, what their town is really dependent on. So as we're transitioning away from fossil fuels into clean energy, this is a program that would help them. The next program is under the Department of Justice, launching an Office of Environmental Justice. This um, would be started up with $1.4 million and there would be an additional 6.5 um, to fund the Environmental and Natural Resources Division um, to, to help environmental justice and help combat um, the climate crisis. The next program is the Green Climate Fund, excuse me. That would be with $1.6 billion. And that is essentially a tool for financing climate adaption and mitigation projects in developing countries. Because often when I think about environmental justice, I think of my neighbors, the folks, you know, sitting next to polluted uh, companies or, or industrial areas. Um, but it's also, you know, island nations that are really threatened by sea level rise. So International funding for, for countries that you know, are most overburdened by the climate change, um, this is funding that would go to help them. There's an additional 3.2 billion loan for the Clean Technology Fund, specifically for financing clean energy projects in developing countries as well. The last one that I'll touch on is through the EPA. There was um, $1.5 billion to help implement Justice 40 initiatives within the EPA. Um, you know, provide funding and, you know, specifically to benefit rural and tribal communities. Um, specifically, 100 million of this funding would go to support new community air quality monitoring and notification program, right? So a lot of fence line communities, communities that are, you know, right next to highly, um, to industries that pollute a lot, um, making sure that, you know, permitting and, you know, civil rights compliance is really up to date and making sure that's as environmentally safe as possible. Um, so very, very important to anyone living near industrial areas. That is the biggest um, stuff going on both in Congress and in the executive branch right now. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll stop here and see if we have any more questions um, on Congress or what's going on. Um, in the administration right now. Thanks, Rosalie, for that very brief, just swift and getting us on, getting us up to date on what is happening. And I see there were questions in the chat about the number of the bill and Melissa was very kind enough to pop that into the chat. Thanks, Melissa. Um, as, as I was listening to Rosalie, a couple of things that were really important um, 
about the, the first of the content of the bill, right? Um, so much of this bill will change really how communities experience or how communities go after justice, um, you know, affecting both the legal um, and the legislative um, systems that we are in today. Um, we talk about the the Civil Rights Act and, and that understanding that environmental justice is part of the civil rights piece. And finally, opening up pathways for communities to ask for their own, to, to be able to defend themselves and to take things to the courts. As we are right now in the US, um, most communities have to go through EPA and there's tons of studies, um, that's the Environmental Protection Agency, there's tons of studies that show that the EPA is very slow to respond when a community makes a complaint they rarely ever take it up all the way to the courts. And so communities are left at the mercy of the, of the administration. And we also know that the systems, um, governing systems in the US have been known to perpetuate environmental racism, environmental injustices. So it is very, it's a conflict of interest sometimes to rely on those same systems to challenge um, ongoing um, environmental racism, especially when the court does not allow you to sue recipients of federal funds. So if the government funded someone to do a project that turns out to be uh, causing an injustice of some sort in your community, very unlikely that the federal government will then go after that same person that they gave funds to address that injustice. And so this would change that. There are a lot of systems in the way policy is written in our country today that have um, need to come up to terms with... Uh, with where we need to be when we talk about a just transition. That was the second thing that, um, that I, I picked up from Rosalie's point. Um, this bill is a key part of our commitment as a community to the broader um, goal of a just transition. I see a just transition as a pathway and environmental justice principles as what we walk on that keep us on that to make sure that wherever we go into in the future as a society, greener community, greener economy, less reliance on fossil fuels and hazardous materials, we want to make sure that communities' rights are not infringed on in that future. And the way we can do that is set things in space now, change our legal system and legislation to a way that makes sure communities feel like they can advocate for their own rights and there is a way for them to seek um, reparations or recuse when something is done, when some wrong has been done. And then the last thing is, um, Rosalie mentioned the lifespan, the, the life cycle of the bill going into um, the House and the Senate, the simple majority. I see some folks already asking in the chat, does my representative, my senator or my representative support this bill? Um, we'll pop a, a link into that and then we'll also share ways that you can connect with your representatives but every representative counts we say a simple majority but it really is not simple and we're going to hear from Saida now about um how communities have been working to um to to like i said to challenge environmental injustices in the community taking matters into their own hand but also flagging the importance of having your elected officials on board as well right like it's all of us that have to be involved with this when we think about environmental justice no system can be left unturned no system can be ignored we need to look at everything from the education to housing to feeding these things are all connected because our lives as human beings are complex and they're not they're not siloed so i'm going to pass it on to Saida now thanks Saida. um just go ahead and introduce yourself and get it started. Thank you, Penel, and thank you, Rosalie. Yeah, this is great. My name is Saida Namaste. I'm the co-director of the American Friends Service Committee New Mexico program, and I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm here in Albuquerque, which is um, Tiwa territory between the tribes of Sandia Pueblo and Isleta Pueblo. And sadly, we're really experiencing um, climate disruption um, right now. We have 20 wildfires in New Mexico that usually start in June and they started in April. And we have the country's largest wildfire burning. So this is affecting my friends and colleagues who've had to evacuate. It's affecting our mountain lions, our elk, our deer, our songbirds. Um, just just in, really sad to see uh, 20 wildfires raging in the spring. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that that's what is happening here where I am and, and how it's affecting us. Um, I have some pictures I wanted to show folks as I talk about the work that we do at AFSC New Mexico. Um, this picture is my former director, Don Bustos, on his family land. Um, I learned a lot from Don. I've been on staff 14 years, and he and I worked together, I think, about 10 years. And the work that we do in New Mexico is, is social justice work. Of course, if you're familiar with AFSC, it's a social justice organization. 
And our work is to accompany land-based peoples of New Mexico in the protection of land and water and working to build a rebuild actually the alternatives to the food system that we have today, which is very exploitive and it's a driver of climate change. When we rebuild these food hubs that, that people can live off their land and keep their water and have access to healthy food, this is how we're caring for the environment and for each other in our work here in New Mexico. And I'm, I'm happy to see that my co-director, I do co-direct this program with Patrick Cadamillo, who's also here um, today in the audience. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the things that we've done over the years, um, the program started in the mid 1970s in Northern New Mexico, um, is that we have had programs where we, we train farmers um, and we train them in sustainable agriculture. And these agricultural jobs are, they're an alternative to the military, to the border patrol, um, and to the typical wage economy. And the, the military is very powerful in our state. They, um, they have taken over a lot of our state. And of course, they're a driver of, one of the biggest drivers of climate change. Oil and gas is also, we're number two in the country for oil production. So that's a big part of our wage economy are these oil and gas and extractive industries. And so we create these alternatives through the sustainable agriculture work that we do. Uh, we've incubated three farmer cooperatives looking at how farmers can be working together instead of competing against each other so that they can all reach markets and hopefully all be economically viable. And we have a real focus on getting their healthy food to low income people, especially children through our farm to school program and through our farm to head start program. Um, and also we have a farm to, we had a farm to food bank program during COVID, but this, because of the way that subsidies work in our food system, um, organic food, as you probably know, is always more money. It's, it's more expensive. It's harder for low income people to reach that. And the farmers we work with didn't want their food only going to people who could afford it or only to you know, high end restaurants that, that want to spotlight organic food, but we wanted to reach everybody. And so we have found ways at AFSC to help work with our state and our county and private foundations to subsidize the food so that the farmers get a fair price, but that it reaches everybody, they all have access. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things that we talk about in terms of our in terms of our work is that I've learned so much in this accompaniment model about what it means to be a land based in your thinking because I'm not a land based person I'm, I'm an urban person in Albuquerque, and so this is a, a picture in northern New Mexico, and when I talk to farmers who are land based they talk about when they look at their mountains like the mountain in this picture. You look at the snowpack and you know that if there's a good snowpack whatever the snowpack is is the water that you're going to have for the year. And then that water is going to be what's going to feed your crops. And so people really look to their mountaintops and think about that. And as an urban person, and if those of you who are, you know, you think about you, you turn on your faucet, but people who live close to the land think about like the, the cycle of water and where it comes from and, and look at the mountaintops to see if there's snow. And sadly in New Mexico, we're in a, a really bad drought. Um, it's, it's, it's beyond, it's, it's the most severe drought. They're now even saying maybe we're beyond the word drought and we're in air, airification. The land-based people that we work with are stewards of the land, belonging to the land, not removed from the land, and that they have a relationship with the land that's not about domination. And this is a really helpful thing for me to think about, again, as someone who wasn't land-based, how do people think about land as not owning it, but at this idea of communal understanding versus private property. And there's also a traditional knowledge that has been passed down here and has continued about how to work with the land, respect the water, grow food, feed communities, um, be in harmony with nature. And a lot of times this traditional knowledge has been dismissed. Um, and there was ideas of like modern technology or, and then sometimes we've had research, research happen at universities here in New Mexico, or other places or scientists who actually look at what their traditional knowledge was and say, oh, wow, they're right. This is true. This was, this was the proper way to use water. Uh, it makes sense, the companion planting. And so then it's accepted if, if someone proves it through that more Western understanding through through science or through research or universities, but this traditional knowledge is so important and I'm, I'm so grateful for the people who have continued it and passed it on. And of course, there's a spirituality to all of this. And um, we have a beautiful ceremony coming up next weekend on May 15th that celebrates the, it's a, it's a religious celebration and it celebrates the sacredness of water and the respect for farmers and of the land. And that's an important part of land-based thinking as well. We'll go to the next slide. Unfortunately, of course, we're in the middle of climate disruption and extractive economies and extractive industry are really uh, driving that. And so our work is definitely to support and lift up and revitalize resilient systems as a way to fight back. Um, this is a picture here at our state capitol. I know there's some folks on the call today from Santa Fe, so you probably recognize it if you're in New Mexico, this is our capital. And uh, people have brought their shovels for Acequia Day. 
Um, Acequias refers to the type of water system that we have here and the way that we govern water as a democracy and not as a commodity. And so people are gathering to, to meet with their state legislators to talk about this traditional system of how we share water. Um, we know that climate disruption is, is a byproduct of these extractive and military economies which dominate our state. And so our best hope is for these alternative systems, these resilient systems that existed before the current agribusiness system, the current industrial systems, the current fossil fuel systems. There were other systems that were here. And so we want to make sure to lift up and revitalize those. Next slide, please. So one of our visions for the future is this rebuilding of the alternative systems. And that's a lot of what our work is focused on. Um, and so just to go through like what that can look like, um, for example, it would look like land-based people not being displaced, but, but affirming their traditional knowledge and values. And we're very lucky at AFSC New Mexico that we've been invited by five different tribes uh, to work with people there um, to support their, their way of life, their, their traditional agriculture, their organic agriculture. Um, our vision would be that small-scale sustainable farms are supported through resources and good policy. We have the current food system that we have today in part because um, the big agri agricultural industry is subsidized. So we're subsidizing monocropping and soil depletion and pesticide use, which affects our pollinators and the, the growth of, of food that's used for, to feed cattle or to create, to create uh, high fructose corn syrup. And those subsidies are not, those resources are not going to these small scale sustainable family farms. And that's a real problem. If we could shift that, that would have a tremendous impact. And I know that's part of the, the bill that we're talking about today. Um, Esequias, again, is, is specific to New Mexico. It's our, our system of water, and we want to see that thriving. We want to see water rights kept in communities to grow food rather than to be sold off as commodities to keep on with development. So we definitely have that battle here in this desert. Water is the most important resource. Water is life, agua es la vida. And there's a lot of people who want that water for, for development, for sprawl, for um, bottled water companies for Amazon, for all kinds of other things beyond like feeding our communities and traditional life. We want to see in our vision that all New Mexicans have access to that healthy food and they have dignity in their work and they're not pushed into um, these extractive industries or into the military or the Border Patrol. And of course, the systems that have created where we are today are colonial and racist and we want those to no longer dominate. So that is our vision for the work that we're doing here. Next slide. And the way that we step towards that vision, we have to first you know, change the way we talk about food systems to understand how we got to the food system that we have today. It wasn't by accident. Our US food system was based on genocide and theft of native land, on the enslavement of Africans, on the exploitation of farm workers, the, the Bracero program, and currently today, the exploitation of farm workers. So we have to understand how we got this food system. We also want to center land-based people as decision makers and leaders, not as an afterthought later. And again, we want to shift the subsidies um, from food production for the food production away from the big ag the export model to that small scale regional food system. And that also means looking at our trade agreements. If we did that, we'd be making our steps towards the vision. I think there might be one more slide. Oh, no, there's not. OK, so we go back to that one. So how that connects then to this bill, um, this bill happening at the federal level was actually tried at a smaller scale at our state level this year in our state legislature. Um, in New Mexico, there are several states who have passed what's called a Green Amendment, which would amend our constitution so that part of civil rights would be environmental rights. And so that was a fascinating hearing um, to, in our state legislature to hear the debate on the Green Amendment because it is so similar to what we're talking about today at the federal level to try it out at a state level. And it was a really close vote. At one point, it was a tie vote, and a tie vote, unfortunately, is a loss, so it didn't pass. But what was interesting for me to sit in on the hearings was that um, hearing the people who were against the Green Amendment, which would be giving environmental rights to all people, the right to have clean air, the right to have clean water, talking about cumulative impacts. Um, the people who were against that were paid lobbyists. And we know that because when they spoke, they had to um, announce that. So they would say, you know, my name is Jane Doe and I am a lobbyist with the Chamber of Commerce. I am a lobbyist with the oil and gas industry. I'm a lobbyist for the cattle industry. So they, it was just lobbyist after lobbyist after lobbyist. I think the only person who wasn't a lobbyist that was against it was the mayor of a small town in Southern New Mexico that relies on oil and gas jobs. And he was worried about that. And then when we heard those who were in support of it, there were no lobbyists. It was community people, it was environmental activists, it was parents, um, it was young people, it was really beautiful. And, at one point, we had heard from the mayor 
of Carlsbad, New Mexico against the bill because he was worried about the loss of oil jobs. And then we heard from a, a high schooler from his town, from Carlsbad saying to the mayor, um, I don't want that job. That's not what I want for my future. I want a green job. Otherwise I'm going to have to move from my town because I don't want to work in the oil industry. So that was just really fascinating to hear the discussion around like people who do not want to transition away from these extractive industries and want to keep it despite all of the, the data that we have of, of the damage it's causing to people's health and to our environment. And then those who really want to see another way. And so if this bill were to pass at the federal level, it would really help New Mexico in helping to transition to these sustainable models. It would help us in terms of, I mean, my air right now is hazardous. There's a hazardous air alert. I can't go out and breathe in Albuquerque, partly from the wildfires, but there's just, um, I see the cumulative impact in so many of the communities we accompany where they are next to corporations that are just damaging and the, the nuclear weapons labs north of us where the fire is heading towards that has dumped radioactive waste into the water and into the soil. And I see indigenous people trying to clean it up with mushrooms and just so much good work happening. But if we could shift these systemic things at, this, at these policy levels, it would have a tremendous impact on the quality of life and in support of rebuilding these systems that land-based people are teaching us we need to go back to. So thank you for listening. And um, I do hope that we can get this EJ bill through. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, super helpful uh, to just hear like a case study of some sort in New Mexico, all that's happening there. Um, I really like the step towards vision and just calling folks to challenge certain ways of thinking, challenge certain um, systems that are currently ongoing um, and having land-based people ask the decision makers and the leaders, not the afterthought. At the beginning with the environmental justice principles, we spoke about, talk about autonomy and self-determination and accountability and including people in processes as a corner, as a key part of environmental justice. So uh, in the interest of time, I, I know there's some conversations happening in the chat. Folks are sharing resources, which is really great as well. Folks are echoing um, what it's looked like when they've dealt with wildfires um, and more. So folks, just keep it coming. Keep it keep the conversation going. Remember, if you have any questions, you can pop them in. Um, any questions for Rosalie and Osira or myself, you can pop them in um, to the chat and we'll get to them towards the end of the call. Um, next, I'm going to pass it on to Larissa, who's with uh, FCNL, and Larissa is going to be joining us um, with three awesome Advocacy Corps members, Devra, Taylor, and Vika, um, who will be sharing about their experience um, lobbying Congress um, for the Environmental Justice for All Act. Thank you. And I have to echo what Rosalie said. I'm also feeling a little bit stuffy, so please excuse if I have to cough or sneeze or anything like that. Um, so I'll tell you all a little bit about what this program does and who these organizers are, and then we'll just jump right into a conversation about what lobbying on this issue has looked like. So at FCNL, I am the young adult program manager, and so I oversee all the work that the young adults in our network do to take action, organize their communities, etc. Um, the Advocacy Core program is a really cool opportunity where we hire up to 20 young adult organizers who then um, do exactly what the title says, right? Organize their communities around one legislative issue. It changes every year. This year we are focusing on environmental justice and specifically the Environmental Justice for All Act. So for 10 months, these organizers are educating their communities, bringing them together around this issue and then lobbying their legislators. So um, we definitely learn a lot from these organizers and you know, the, the information that they get from their offices really helps our um, work that we do at FCNL like with uh, our lobby visits that happen from our staff. And then what we learn from FCNL lobby visits, we're also uh, working with the organizers. So it's really a flow of information to make sure that our, our lobbying and our advocacy is as effective as it can be. So um, we are joined by, you see them on the screen, Devra, Taylor, and Vika, and they are all spread out, right? So we have Devra in Connecticut, Taylor in Ohio, and Vika in Wisconsin. And later you'll see the various states that we have other advocacy core organizers in. But let's just start talking about this experience, y'all. Um, I guess I'll start with a very basic question and I'll throw it to Vika 
first, just so there's not a scramble to see who's going to speak first. And then really, I want it to be a conversation. But our first step in getting these organizers together and working on this issue was figuring out why we cared about this issue. That really carries you through any of your advocacy that you're doing, grounding yourself in your why. So Vika, what was your process in figuring out why you cared about this issue, how it was affecting your community, and how has that kind of shown up in your advocacy? And then everyone else, please jump in after. Oh, it looks like Vika is unable to, here, ask to unmute. Okay, there you go. Okay. Okay, sorry. Um, so again, I'm Vika Malinchuk. I'm an advocacy core organizer in Beloit, Wisconsin. I attend Beloit College. And I have always really been into environmental science from a science perspective and geology. I really like learning about the earth. And so that was kind of my bridge into getting into environmental justice. While I had looked at it from the scientific side and I knew um, the effects and how it affected the earth. I uh, didn't know as much about the justice side and how it was affecting the people on the earth. Um, and so I had a moment in my geology class and it really shifted my perspective from just a scientific one to also a justice and a social justice one. I learned about how river systems uh, work naturally. And then I learned about how they're damaged and then how much damage that does to the people that then have to live there, which are uh, more than likely people who are living in poverty or people of color or um, uh, minorities. And that really hit me. And that was kind of my moment of, oh, this isn't just a class. Like this affects everyday people. This affects me. How is this affecting my communities, um, both my hometown and my college community, which is Beloit, Wisconsin. And so that's how I really got into working with environmental justice and the Environmental Justice for All Act specifically. Hi, my name is Deborah Baxter. I am also a member of the Advocacy Corps. I am organizing currently in Cromwell, Connecticut. And I think what really had me centering myself around this issue and um, coming to terms with why it was um, important for me was just taking the time at the beginning of the program to really learn about this issue and why it was so important to everyone in this nation. Um, I had been really interested in social justice issues throughout college. Um, and had, uh, had experience advocating for other issues. And also I was um, interested and aware of climate issues around the world, but um, be being a part of this program and hearing about how um, environmental justice and kind of just overall climate issues like really intersect and um, how they really affect um, different marginalized groups of people in completely different ways um, all across the country um, really made the issue seem like very important to me. So although at the beginning of the program, I did not know much about environmental justice and I find it hard in the beginning to find out why exactly it or how exactly it impacted me. Um, at the beginning of the program, I would like look outside and say, well, I just don't know how this um, issue, you know, impacts you know, me, I don't, you know, live in an area where I, you know, see these issues day to day. But as I learned more about how it affects people, as I talked to people in my community and heard that how it impacted them here, but also the stories that they could tell me about other people, um, it just made me realize how big the issue was and why it was. It wasn't so much important that I could speak to how it impacted me specifically but just kind of understanding how deep it ran in this country and how all of us are kind of connected by this. Cause although it might not impact, you know, the neighborhood and community that I am um, connected to specifically, I can think about, you know, many ways that it impacts, you know, someone I know or impacts me in ways um, that are, 
you know, a little bit unique. So I think just realizing how big the issue really was and how we're all kind of connected to it in one way or another um, really is why like this issue uh, means so much to me at this point. And I was able to kind of center myself around it. Hi everyone. Um, so my name is Taylor Powell Abenanti. I am originally from New Richmond, Ohio, but I currently have been organizing for the past year at my college in Wilmington. And environmental justice for me was really interesting when I first filled out the application. I've always been interested in climate. Like I think all of us has kind of discussed that. Like we've all had an interest in this field. Um, but for me, I've always kind of centered myself in that area. I've always been super, super involved and um, extracurriculars involved with that. I'm currently the president of Ecology Club here at school I is doing that in high school, um, love field research, all of the gist. But over time, um, you know, once we started the training, I was like, you know, how does this really apply to me? When we were going through learning about it, um, I wasn't aware of all of the specifics of environmental justice and all what it includes. And most people aren't. So actually a power plant in my hometown um, was in the process of being demolished and part of it fell into the Ohio River. Um, and it was also found that the wastewater ponds were not properly lined. Um, so all of the heavy toxic metals was seeping into the groundwater and my hometown uses an underground aquifer as its water source. So that was um, directly harming, you know, my whole town's water supply. Um, so for me, that was kind of like an eye-opening moment. And with the closure and demolition of that power plant, um, it's affected our economy as well. And um, most of our town, I think it's less than 3,000 people. Um, most of them depended on this power plant for, um, you know, a job. And now with the demolition and the destruction of it, there's no green energy or no sustainable energy to take place of that. And I think that's where some of the provisions come in mind with environmental justice. So that was kind of an eye-opening moment for me. So I was like, wow, this technique, it does apply to my community. It's um, shining in a new light. And I was like, okay, if it's happening in my community, maybe it's time for me to open up my eyes and see where I can get some more um, community exposure. And that's when I started looking here at Wilmington when I was at school. And um, just a couple of weeks ago, we actually had a um, oil spill from the railroad tracks that cross over um, some of our water sources and lakes and streams. And 2,000 animals were killed in less than two days um, just from an oil spill. In Wilmington, which is not a very, very large town, like at all, it's a small ag community. And um, just that impact alone, I was like, there's another example of how it's happening in my community. So for me, I think the reason why I care about it so much is that I've, I've been able to see it in different places in different instances, and it's not one thing. And that's the problem with it. I'd recently just read a book called The Violence of Climate Change by Kevin J. O'Brien. It's a really, really good book. And it talks about nonviolent ways to um, combat climate change. And, you know, what can we learn from people in the past, such as Martin Luther um, King Jr., uh, um, Cesar Chavez, you know, Jane Addams, John Woolman. Um, and looking back on that, he offered a lot of evidence to support the fact that climate change is a wicked problem, that there's not one solution. So we have to look at all of these different routes of how we can combat the issue. So for me, that's why I care about the issue is because I know that no matter how small the organizing I'm doing may seem in the grand scheme of things, I know I was looking at our, um, our, our, our board that shows like all of the lobby visits we've done. We've got, we've got almost like 90 visits, I think, from just our advocacy core group. So like, that's crazy. And that just shows the power of grassroots advocacy. So for me, that's why I care. It's because no matter how big the, the difference may seem it's like we truly are making an impact you just have to keep the momentum going and environmental justice is, is important and it needs to be acknowledged on a larger scale than what it is because the exposure is happening to a lot more people so yeah thank you thanks taylor and actually i'm going to ask you another question because i know that speaking of lobby visits you just completed a couple kind of in a row so you know you all took this time to sit with your stories how have you seen stories kind of play out in your advocacy? What does that, what does that look like as a tool in the, in the lobby visits that you've done so far? 
Yeah, well, um, I know Larissa, me and you've talked about this, but um, a really cool thing I was able to do here recently is go back to my former high school um, in New Richmond and have my old environmental science teacher who is very educated on you know the topics and the science behind it. So she was super intrigued and she is actually the advisor of the eco club that I was president of in high school. So she got some eco club students involved. And since my story directly relates to New Richmond Heights, like New Richmond, and it's affecting the New Richmond school districts um, because there was so much property tax and also donations from the power plant to the school district, we are now looking at a deficit and we might have to do more school closures, which is super, super unfortunate. But had the chance to go and lobby at the high school and use that story in the visit and the kids were actually able to see the connection. They were like, wow, like this makes sense. Like, this is so cool. It's eye-opening. I'm able to relate to this. We're able to see exactly how it's affecting our community. And that's something that I didn't have the opportunity to do in high school. And a couple of them have reached out to me and they're like, this is really, really cool. And a couple of them are seniors and they're like, wow, like, going to college for like criminal justice and stuff like that and like once like biology and like don't limit yourself like if you think this is a cool issue go for it I'm like just because you're not a political science student or you're not looking into this for a job doesn't mean that you can't be part of the action and you know have something to say in the conversation because that's where the power is is in the numbers and just from going back to my high school I had 11 constituents join me who have never lobbied before. Um, so that was super cool. And, and some of them, like it ranged all between freshmen to seniors. So it was all kinds of different age ranges and it was a really cool opportunity. So yeah, that's, I think that's probably the best answer to that question. Yeah, I think that connecting piece is really important and I'm glad they had that moment of like, oh, light bulb going off. So, okay. I'm going to start out with Devra for the, my next question, but then like, I really want everyone to jump in with their own experience. Um, everyone has a different answer to this, right? Because we all have different legislators, but we're talking about the Environmental Justice for All Act. How has that advocacy gone? Um, what have offices been receptive to? I mean, it's been 10 months now we've lobbied on this and I know our conversations with these offices have had to evolve and, and change. And so what have they been receptive to? And just generally, how do you think that um, those conversations have gone? So I've been, I'm very fortunate, I guess, in lobbying for environmental justice that I am from Connecticut, which is a pretty, it's a blue state, it's pretty progressive and everyone that I've, um lobbied for has been kind of on um like very in agreement of what we're asking everyone has in the past um supported climate issues so it hasn't been incredibly um difficult to have those conversations i guess the most difficult thing for me and this being the first job that i really had that was working with policymakers, so i found this pretty frustrating was getting them on board to do or to um, you know agree with the legislation that we want them to. So like this past year, um, I had a few conversations with different um, like senators and representatives, and when we would ask them to support specifically in the Environmental Justice for All Act, it was always that you know oh we're really we really like what they have to say there and we're not against it but at the same time they weren't exactly ready to um publicly support it they weren't really willing to do more um so that was something that i had to kind of deal with and strategize strategize with larissa about and kind of get um past that and uh, i guess kind of connecting back to your last question larissa i think that's where the stories really kind of changed the game, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, it was really amazing to, you know, bring people into the lobby visits and have everyone kind of give their very unique stories and why the issue mattered to them and have that have a very clear and distinct um, effect on the congressperson or the staffer. Um, and when I would, you know, bring people on these visits and we would be practicing and I would be going through 
um, the lobby roadmap and kind of teaching them what we're going to do. Um, and I get to the stories part, they're always kind of think that, you know, there has to be something more to it. They're like, well, is there something I can cite? Is there like an article or some piece of legislation that I need to like give them? And I'm like, no, really, it's just about like why this matters to you, what you see in your community and why they should care. And that always never, that never seems like enough for them that they need to really give more, but um, really seeing how these grassroots movements do have the power. And it might seem small that, you know, my voice is really gonna make a difference, but it's not just my voice, it's my story, your story, and all the other stories that, you know, I would bring to them and that they hear. And then as Taylor mentioned, we've had, as our small group, we've had over 90 visits, so, um, it's been really interesting to meet with all of uh, my Congress um, men and talk to them about this issue. It's been kind of frustrating to hear how they um, are for it, but aren't ready to sign on. Um, but it's been really rewarding to see really how powerful our voices are. And sometimes you hear that and you don't really believe it, but when you're in those rooms and you're having those conversations and you can see the person be moved by what you're telling them, um, I think that's been something that's been like just really rewarding and really um, momentum or momentous in like moving this legislation forward. Yeah, I actually agree with that a lot. I um, I got a little bit frustrated because one of my offices was in support. Um, however, they just weren't ready to sign and they didn't want their name on that bill. So I had a very similar experience there. But I also found that the stories were super impactful and that my senators and representative was they were super receptive to those stories because we are the people that they're representing. They want to hear from us. We are the voters. They want to hear about what's happening in their state. It's it's relevant to them. And so the stories were kind of a key thing for me and um, the people who I brought on the lobby visits. And it's also um, it's also a learning experience for the people that I brought on the lobby visits because they also didn't know that their voice had a lot of power. They didn't know that they could really influence legislation, but they can. And everyday people can, in, can influence everyday legislation. So that was super powerful, not only for the legislators, but also for the constituents. Yeah, I'd love to hop in on that question because I think it's, it's really important to talk about this. I would say overall, um, I have lobbied primarily the, um, I've organized for constituents to meet with Representative Kerry um, for District 15 where Wilmington's located. And then I've also lobbied back to my home district, District 2, which is Representative Brad Winstrup. Um, and then primarily been lobbying um, Senator Brown's office and then Senator Portman's office. I will say um, Senator Brown is the only Democrat out of the four and his drawbacks on the bill have been the lack of bipartisan support um, and the need of just compromise. He wants to be able to bring on um, Republicans as he comes on, but there's a lot of Republican pushback due to the main thing that I've been able to gather from all of my notes and just from over the whole course of the year is a lot of Republican offices push back against the um, federal permit process being so long and it being um, so complicated. Um, that's been a pretty steady thing with all the visits I've had with offices of such. And I think that's where I've had a lot of success in like having these discussions um, because, you know, we will have these open discussions where they'll tell us how they feel and then we'll be like, okay, well, can we give some input on that? And when we went and met with Representative Brad Winship's office um, back in my high school, um, we got into a whole conversation regarding NEPA and um, that, and then through the follow-up, me and him were able to continue on this conversation. So um, I feel like overall the bill is being acknowledged and the stories like Vika was saying are taking into um, consideration heavily. Um, I've seen a lot of the stories that I've had presented from constituents do awesome in visits, um, especially ones we fo um, focused around agriculture um, and, you know, small, small towns and local impacts, because that's something that a lot of people can visualize 
I feel like, and can also sympathize because most people, um, especially in Ohio and with the constituents I'm bringing in the districts I'm attending to are small town, um, small business um, people. So it's really able to make that connection. And I feel like that's been a really important thing for me. Um, but I think, yeah, that rounds out my answer to the question. Well, thank you all. I um, remember when we started this program, when we were you know, first sitting down to train all the organizers, I spoke with the lobby team at FCNL about how this was really about continuing to build momentum for this issue, right? Like this bill is really trying to do a lot to help standardize environmental justice in our policymaking process, to bring directly impacted communities into the policymaking process, to give them more resources. Um, and so it's an interesting experience to have organizers sometimes bring this bill up to an office for the first time. And I forget now who was the one that said it. Um, but, you know, to bring more people in, we need, like, in terms of signing the paper, like, actually signing onto the bill officially to bring more legislators in in that way, we need more stories, we need to keep building that momentum, and to the piece where we are a nonpartisan organization, we need signers from both sides of the aisle as well, um, it is an interesting feedback that we have gotten from lots of offices where the, the lack of bipartisanship on this particular issue right now seems to be one of the biggest hurdles in getting this pushed forward. So that's why we need um, organizers in all states and all communities talking to all of our legislators. And so some of us uh, in the program have it a little bit easier. We're talking to relatively supportive offices where we're just trying to get them over that last bump. And then other people are kind of starting at, at step one with their offices, but all of that hard work needs to be done. So we are really grateful for the work that the Advocacy Corps has done on this already and for sharing some of your experiences tonight on the call. I will hand it back to Peniel for the rest of the event. Thank you. Larissa, I see there's a quick question about the Advocacy Corps timeframe, um, in particular, um, what's next after the 10 months of the um, of folks focusing on this bill um, and the chances of being extended, if you wanted to just respond to that. Yeah, well, I mean, I know that Rosalie and our other climate lobbyist, Clarence, will be working on this year round. Um, the Advocacy Corps, unfortunately, will be shifting focus to another legislative issue for the next cohort. So this program will be running until the end of May. And I'm going to put something in the chat later for people to sign up if they want to connect with an organizer or have questions about what's happening in their state. Um, past these 10 months, we will continue to provide opportunities for action, but this program in particular will only run until the end of May, and then we'll shift focus when our next cohort starts in August. Great, thanks Larissa for answering that. Um, and yeah, there's, we're gonna share more opportunities for folks to get engaged and to keep connected. Um, as we had shared earlier, this bill has been, um, was introduced in the previous Congress, was introduced in this one, and there is commitment from leadership in the House Natural Resource Committee to continue to work on this bill and improve this bill um, until they get to a position where um, they are able to pass the legislation. And I see another question in the chat here about um, you know, updates on the climate parts of the reconciliation package, formerly known as the Build Back Better. I want to see, Rosalie, if you have any pieces to chime in there. I'll just briefly say, um, as we know, or as some of you might know, the Build Back Better is no longer what it used to be, where it started out with the $3.5 trillion um, proposal from the, the White House on how they wanted to um, ch um, address social social um, issues in the, in the country has been scaled down, back significantly um, because of, um, of a lack of consensus and cohesion in the Democratic Party, who is currently in leadership. Um, and we know that um, of all the things that have been caught, 
climate and energy still keep coming up and somehow have made it through in terms of what the priorities are. However, at this stage, we hear that there's still ongoing negotiations on process rather than content. Um, and so process in terms of are we still going to use reconciliation to pass legislation or to make changes to the way we're addressing climate change as a country and addressing our energy dependency on fossil fuels or, or moving towards greener sources of energy? Um, for folks who might be unfamiliar, the reconciliation process allows um, the Senate to bypass the supermajority rule um, and just pass the legislation with only 51 votes. Um, and given that there is sort of a, a split in the Senate, that is the only way that they can pass um, narrow sort of democratic only um, visions and proposals. Um, and so currently there's conversations around what the climate change provisions are gonna look like. Um, they are in, hoping for climate change provisions that um, contribute towards revenue and address the budget deficits and do not contribute towards inflation, but rather reduce energy costs for families. Um, what that means and what that actual policy looks like is still up in the air. We also know that challenges around um, what is currently ongoing in the Ukraine, the Ru Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, also affects our what energy policies look like. And we also know Senator Manchin of West Virginia, who has been a real stakeholder of some sorts in this whole saga that is the Build Back Better drama, um, has been um, heard to be considering some other kind of energy legislation that will be bought more bipartisan. Um, and that really takes away the focus from the climate change, using energy as a way to address climate change, but rather addressing just energy issues without considering the climate change piece. And that really limits the scope of the bill and does not address the true crisis that we are currently all going through as a society. So I'll just pause briefly to see if um, Rosalie had anything else to add on that point. Um, and just want to say thanks to Saira for popping some things in the chat as well. Rosalie, any, any additions on that? Yeah, thanks, Pam. I mean, you covered it really well, but um, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> I got a tickle in my throat. This uh, cold is really taking it out of me. But um, yeah, at this point, um, we are kind of running down on time to get reconciliation passed and this new bipartisan climate um, package or bill that Manchin has kind of been talking about and having meetings around lately. At this point, we really see this as kind of a distraction from getting things through in reconciliation. Reconciliation at this point, or what was you know formally known as Build Back Better, um, is the clearest path to climate action and it has the most potential to be a really transformative package and really impact a lot of lives um, and really get our, our climate action in the United States kicked off. So um, well, bipartisan engagement on climate is really important to us, um, through reconciliation is really how we want to see it. Um, so just reemphasizing that point that Peniel made. Thanks, Rosalie. I know we are running out of time, um, so we just want to move quickly to our action items. Um, and we'll just let folks know that um, all of this information, the slides, the links, everything will be in the follow-up email as well. So we just wanna, in terms of the call to action, I think something we've heard from our speakers today, um, and oh, a quick word of gratitude to our Advocacy core members um, for sharing their experience and lobbying and just coming to share honestly with us their journey thus far. So find your why. They, all the advocacy core members spoke about how they found their why, what ensured them that they were grounded in environmental justice, what principles, whether it was through their faith, their culture, their experience um, that kept them inspired and moved them towards, um, towards action. Find your who, who are you doing, who are you on this journey with? Advocacy core members were able to share experiences together. Um, Taylor spoke about going back to his high school um, with his with his former teacher. Um, other folks are talking to community members um, as well, um, looking for folks in the community that are directly impacted um, by environmental injustices to do this work together because it's all about community. It is not a siloed experience. And lastly, find your what. What can you do? How can you get involved? What actions can you take? So we'll move to the next slide for a couple of ways that you can be involved. 
Um, first, back to this legislation, right? It is not perfect. It can still be better. If it hasn't heard from you, then it is not perfect because you are community. So this is an opportunity for you to chime in. We'll share some links in the chat um, and in the follow-up. Um, there's a platform that Congress is now trying out to get more direct input from community members on legislation. Um, and so you can just go on there and you'll see some statements from organizations like FCNL and AFSC who supported this legislation as well as other community members um, who support this legislation and are calling on their members of Congress to to, to um, support the legislation. We will also be following up in the email with opportunities to be involved in the community listening sessions that Rosalie flagged at the beginning of the call. And these are being scheduled and they will be hybrid to our understanding. And so we'll make sure that there's, um, there's a link for you to RSVP to show up and share honestly from your perspective because all, all perspectives are important to make sure that it is, like we said, not just about equity, but about justice. Um, and then also um, we'll pop a link in the chat um, for you to be able to send a quick email to your member of Congress, um, letting them know that you support this bill, letting them know that this is, um, you believe that we can, this is a key step towards securing environmental justice for all. So I popped those three things in the chat. One for you to comment directly on the bill, a video to watch how to use the platform if you're not familiar with the platform, and an action alert, which is what we call it um, in the movement space from FCNL, for you to um, send an email to your member of Congress. Um, Another way is to join a lobby visit. Our Advocacy Corps members are in their final lap of visits for the month of May, and they're inviting you to join them. If you're in Connecticut, Indiana, Georgia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Texas, California, Florida, New York, Alabama, South Dakota, Ohio, and I think that is Wisconsin. Um, they're Advocacy Corps members who are eager to join you, um, to have you join them in, in lobbying your senators and members of Congress. They have all the resources. They can teach you on the process processes, make it very simple, make sure that all you have to do is show up in your authentic self, share your story and your story of your communities, and urge your members of Congress to, to have, um, to take action. Um, so um, I think Larissa just popped quickly in the chat that um, link for the form, if you want to be connected with an organizer to, to, uh, to meet with your member of Congress, if you're from any of these states. And if you're not from these states, no need to just reach out to either of us um, and we'll make sure um, to connect you with your member of Congress if you want to share a story, if you want to have a phone call, if you feel like you want to organize something yourself. Rosalie, did you want to chime in briefly? Just whenever you're done with this piece. Yeah. Okay, um, I think I'll look at the next slide. I think the next slide is kind of our closing out. So you can take on this piece then. Yeah, so yeah, just say thank you to everybody for joining us tonight. We did go over an hour, um, so really appreciate your patience and, and kind of just sticking with us um, to, to hear a lot of the great voices that we heard from Advocacy Corps, our friends in New Mexico, um, and from both AFSC and FCNL. So I did want to share a couple opportunities specifically from FCNL to stay engaged on climate issues if you aren't already a part of them. The first of which is our, um, our regular uh, newsletter that I write um, at the beginning of each month. It usually gets published on the first Thursday of each month um, called Inside the Greenhouse. So I, I went ahead and pasted the link in the chat if you'd like to subscribe to that. Um, that's monthly updates, just general environmental news um, and kind of updates on what my boss and I have been working on within our environmental program. The other opportunity to engage um, with my boss and I, Clarence Edwards, the, he's the um, legislative director for the climate program at FCNL. Um, on the first and third Thursdays of each month, we get together um, with other constituents and talk about action opportunities um, you know, going on that, that you can be working on. So often it's you know, encouraging you to write a letter to the editor or an op-ed um, if there's like a specific um, like comment you can make similar to commenting on the environmental justice screening tool or um, uh, any kind of, you know, EPA ruling that's going out, um, opportunities like that. So if you're kind of just looking to up your game or need more inspiration for your climate action, you're welcome to join us. We meet at 3 p.m. Eastern time on the first Thursday of the month and 6 p.m. Eastern time on the third Thursday of the month. So you can go ahead and click that link that I put in the chat and take a look at the next upcoming dates we have. So the next one 
um, does take place tomorrow. So if you have questions, you know, you want to hear from me and my boss Clarence, um, feel free to join us tomorrow and we can we can get some more questions then. So yeah, I'll pass it back to Peniel. Thanks, Rosalie. So exciting to see all the work FCM is doing and the spaces that are being curated for folks to learn, to join, to up their activism. If you just go to the next slide, um, at AFSC as well, we have a lot going on. If you know AFSC, we are for social justice and so we're working in multiple spaces and we see environmental justice as a lens through which we deliver on the rights for community members. So you have the first link here if you want to sign up for mobile alerts. This is when you need to take quick action. Maybe Congress is voting on something and we really need for your Congress member to hear from you in real time as they make decisions. You get a quick, simple, short text message letting you to quickly send an email to your member of Congress. That's afsc.org forward slash sign up. Very simple. Um, next slide, please. And we know so much is going on in the world today. There's so many injustices, there's so many ways you and us and other community members are working to make sure that we're protecting our, our loved ones, our community members. Every weekend on Saturday morning at AFSC, we just cu we curate a nice, um, simple, easy way for you to keep up with your activism, ways to take action, read um, of it, read about exciting programs and projects and advocacy opportunities like that programs like in New Mexico or Guatemala or in North Carolina are doing to protect community members and to protect the rights of community members. We also have events like this one that you've attended. So you just go to afsc.org forward slash we can read in, you sign up and once a week you get a nice curated list of events to make sure that you're connected, you're plugged in for your activism, and you're leaving out your faith and your values into action. So that is the other slide there. And I think that is it from us today. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, thanks for everyone popping things in the chat. A bunch of resources were shared as well. Many that are, I will also be checking out and we'll try and plug those into the follow-up email. Um, we also have... Uh, um, a bunch of things that will be following up with the slides um, and we encourage you to sign up to things to to join actions as they come up um, and to to ensure that you're meeting with your member of Congress, you can also tweet at them. Just a, a cool way to make sure that they know that you're keeping tabs of what they're doing. It doesn't always have to be a formal email. You can just tweet at them and I'll let you know as someone who's in this space, they look at their tweets. That is something somebody is tabbed on the tweets and they respond to them um, and you can just bug them on the tweets. So make sure you use that opportunity to highlight that. Oh, I heard about this Environmental Justice for All Act, Senator Who. Um, what are you doing about it? Um, I'd like to hear more and encourage other community members to bug them as well on Twitter. You can say AFSC and FC and I'll send to you. You'll be fine. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, for, for joining us. Um, we'll just take a brief moment of silence to really just digest what we've heard today um, from our participants, from our panelists, um, from what you all have shared in the chat as well. Thank you for being so engaging. Um, and that's it for me. So just a moment of silence and then you can hop off as you feel led. <laughs> 